Artificial intelligence, or AI for short, has been described as a transformative technology that will reshape business, education, and social institutions. Many view its transformational promise as a positive extension of human capabilities, while others view it with suspicion, considering it an insidious technology that will disrupt the foundations of our society and cause more harm than good. These opposing views have ignited a debate about AI's future, how it's to be regulated or even banned. We'll discuss these issues with Dr. Amir Gavin, a New York Tech alum. He is currently head of the Artificial Intelligence Lab at Israel's Ministry of Education. His research is focused on the benefits that AI technologies can bring to learning and teaching practices, and the key challenges and concerns including ethics, privacy, and fairness. We'll discuss the current debate about AI and its potential to change institutions, how work is done, and adapting systems and practices to maximize its potential, and how regulators need to act quickly and rationally to minimize the damaging possibilities. Amir, welcome to our podcast series. Hi, thank you. Very happy uh, to be here. Before we talk about the main topic of our discussion today, which is artificial intelligence, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Of course, I'll uh, start with my experiences with NYIT because I think really this was like the jump start to my career. Mm-hmm. It started many years ago. I think in NYIT, this is where I really got into technology. Mm-hmm. So I started my career around e-commerce and then moving into mobile commerce and then moving into business intelligence and then moving into artificial intelligence. Today, I manage an artificial intelligence lab for the Israeli Ministry of Education. I'm also serving as a faculty in institution learning educational technologies, learning technologies, and of course, artificial intelligence. I also doing currently a lot of guidance, both on the uh, public education system as well as the higher education system, because there's a tremendous need, first of all, of management, administration, faculty, teachers, to better understand what it is, what are the opportunities, what are the risks so they can then work with their students uh, of all ages, of all levels um, around it. So really f- fascinating things. Also, this is a good opportunity to thank Deborah Cohen invited me actually on campus in New York to provide a guest lecture around those areas. And today, this podcast, we will continue to elaborate and expand on that. Oh, so okay. really... Again, thank you for the invitation of the opportunity. Excellent. I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation. And, and it fits in with our primary theme for this season, which is change. And certainly AI is a transformative technology, and it does have the potential to bring significant change to education, business, medicine, research, and social institutions that is unlike anything we've experienced since the dawn of the Internet. And But one of the things I'm seeing is that it seems to have conjured up a lot of fear over its use. And I go back to November of 22, when OpenAI released Chatbot GBT, which was immediately denounced by many educators as a free and easy way for students to cheat. So much so that the Los Angeles Unified School District blocked access to OpenAI's website from its network. And this week, for example, in New York City on July 10th, the city put into effect the Automated Employment Decision Tool Law which requires that employers who use AI in hiring must tell candidates that they're doing so out of a fear that AI automates and entrenches existing racial and gender biases. So let's start out with what is AI and why has it caused such a visceral reaction and calls for regulation? You know, there's several definitions of, of AI, but the one that I relate to and it's also, in a way, explained the, uh, the fear and the concern is that uh, artificial intelligence, we're talking about computers and technologies that can perform tasks that up until now, up until the artificial intelligence, it required human beings to perform it. And I think one of the, the good examples that I like to use in order to better understand the concept, it is uh, driving, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, relates to autonomous vehicles. Mm-hmm. 
I think many of our audience knows already got their uh, driving licenses, and they not only that they know how complex and not to say dangerous yeah. is the act of driving. Okay, this is something that requires lots of judgment, lots of attention, very fast responses to to an endless amount of situations that we can get into on the road. And here we take artificial intelligence and we tell her or him, regardless, here, take the wheel and drive the car. And we are going to be sitting without any control on the back seat. And this is not science fiction. We have Waymo in Phoenix, Arizona, driving those cars all over the place. So here it's a good example. Mm. of the definition of artificial intelligence, whereas computers, machines, take over tasks that up until now we thought that only human being can perform. So with that comes great opportunities and great concerns mm. and great fear, as you mentioned. And it's totally okay to fear from that. What's kind of amazing to me is that the concept of artificial intelligence has been around since the 1950s. And over the last decade or so, it's really come to the forefront and people sort of waking up that it's here, we're using it, we take advantage of it every single day when I ask Alexa to do something for me, right? All of these things have existed for quite some time, but is it because we're on the precipice of really implementing it in a large way that all of a sudden we're trying to start to regulate it? I think that what the awakening call, or maybe awakening alarm, and you mentioned November 30, 2022, mm-hmm. when OpenAI launched just, just GPT. This is, you know, a tipping point, a turning point in this area. And you're absolutely right, AI has been around for many years. But, uh, so the question is, what, what changed? Why this GPT as the poster boy of a whole category Right. That we call it a generative AI. And the reason being is that up until now, we knew that AI is around us. And even taking action and recommendations for our life, the key difference now in the past six months is that up until GPT came, we usually didn't have a direct access to those AI engines. We knew that the programmers on Amazon on Facebook, on Google, on whatever, are using AI within their products. But it was, in a way, a seamless to us. The people who got access to that, programmers and data scientists working for those uh, technology firms to design those products. Right. So suddenly what happened six months ago is that someone, <laughs> this someone is open AI, decided, let's do an experiment. Let's take this uh, AI engine, powerful engine, simplify the access to them through a chatbot, through a chat mechanism, Mm. and let's uh, give it to the public, and let's see what happens. And you know, the rest is history. The public, you know, jumped on that, you know, within five days from launch, there were already million users. And uh, before we knew it, after two months, 100 million users. This is unprecedented. That there was no such technology ever with such a huge adoption rate. So it turns out that you know the world, human beings, were maybe they didn't know before uh, the, the launch how much they will like it, use it, adopt it. Although there's still some. It's not like a, this technology is not matured yet. It's in a way very, very beginning and it still has some bugs and flows and mistakes and biases and difficulties with references. And it's like a 70% baked product mm. and still, you know, people love it. And this is the change for the first time in a way in the technology history. Every one of us can now do stuff on generative AI that was only can be done a year ago with uh, programmers. 
and data scientists. And that's fascinating. You're absolutely, I think, on target. The mass exposure of the public to the technology and then really all of us starting to realize what's the potential of it because now we get to use it and how good it is and seeing some of the faults in it as it progresses. In your role at the Ministry of Education, what are you seeing as the most significant opportunities to use AI to improve education? Let's say, first of all, AI in general, before we go to generative AI. Mm. The biggest promise of artificial intelligence in education is personalization. Artificial intelligence has the capacity the capability to sense the environment, the students, how they learn, what they like, what their pace, what, what their level of, of proficiency in this, and then create for them a personalized, adaptive learning path. Suddenly, every student has an amazing, okay, personal tutor, hmm. and every teacher and professor have an amazing teaching assistant. And, and from here, you know, there's so many opportunities. It's a fascinating area of customization. I know that the initial reaction to it was that we were essentially allowing uh, people to use it to, to cheat. As pointed out in a recent MIT review article, that cheating is not a new problem. Schools have survived calculators, Google, Wikipedia, and the use of specific websites as an example. But they've managed to use artificial intelligence as an example. I used a program called Turnitin that would analyze what I was writing and make sure that I properly annotated it and that I wasn't committing plagiarism. So there's both sides of it. And I think that customization aspects is something that you know people have to understand could be a huge benefit. Okay, so let me address this from a few points. First of all, shortly before our call, maybe this would be a surprising fact to the students or even for, uh, you know, higher education faculty. Mm -hmm. I went into a Google Scholar, okay, and did an advanced search on Google Scholar, and uh, uh, my request was to generate articles that appears in, you know, in peer-reviewed uh, journal, academic articles. Right. Whereas one of the authors, you have the, the option to search by an author. So I put uh, ChatGPT as an author for uh, academic papers, and I got 37 of them. <laughs> Some of them are by, by recognized and respectful publications, and you can see name A, name B, and then ChatGPT listed as an author, one of the authors of the article. So... I think this is really, you know, shocking us that, that a peer-reviewed, respectful journals are now willing to accept papers that ChatGPT is listed as one of the authors. <laughs> it's not it's just amazing. to say within the article to say in this paragraph or that paragraph we use ChatGPT. That was this is something that we have hundreds of examples, but this is even an, an upgrade that is to become an author. So how we said that the cheese is moving, it's moving quickly. And I think we can only uh, estimate that within, if uh, today we have 40 of those you know, articles, next week we would have 100, and in one year from now we would have 2,000, whatever. The other uh, aspect about the fear of educators, and it, it is a justified fear, I can relate to it, that some teachers would say, that, or uh, faculty said, no, that this is the end of, of teaching or learning. What can I do? I, I give my students to write papers or even to write their thesis or so, whatever. And they go to this uh, GPT and they copy paste and they submit. How can I grade something like that? And even not just the grade is the issue. Do my students learn anything? And this was triggered, you know, the banning mm. that you mentioned yeah. in several places. Now, I think that was a, a reaction to a dramatic situation that happened. But I think behind it, we need to breathe a little bit to relax, okay? It's not, to my opinion, it's not the, the end of the world. Mm. And I think maybe there is a big promise here to change. I, I would say that if I give my students an assignment and 
All you need to do in order to fulfill this assignment is to write one poem, do a copy-paste and send it back. I don't blame the, the student for, for anything. I think that I would take as a teacher, as a faculty, responsibility to think maybe my work, the assignment that I gave it was not that good. That if all it requires is one prompt on chat GPT and send it back. So here, and that's not a challenge for the students. It's a challenge for me as a teacher to, mm. to start and think, okay, so probably I need to, to change something. Probably in the uh, assignments that I give my students, I need to include further items and elements so just to do a simple copy-paste from GPT would not cut it. You would not get you know, a, a good grade if this is what you do as a student. Now, this is a challenge for them as faculty. And what I'm doing now in, in the Ministry of Education, experiment around those things, first of all, to understand this technology, how it's being used, what are the limitations, and most important, to start and develop a pedagogical concept mm. and model, and I would give a few examples. So just using ChatGPT would not be enough. Okay, We don't really have the possibility, a realistic possibility to ban and to block it. And, you know, students are using their own laptop, tablet, smartphone, and that's not something that we can do. Not to mention they're using this technology at home. Unlike traditional cheating and copying from other sources, the output of uh, generative AI and just GPT are original. So if we get an answer from a student, we cannot find this answer anywhere else on the web. So it would be highly difficult to prove, if we want to prove that someone cheated, the job market is expecting our graduates, our schools and uh, higher education graduates to be familiar, to be knowledgeable, and to be experienced with generative AI. It's becoming an acceptable tool within the, the workplace. So, yes, we have a challenge as educators around it, but if we think that one of our goals and objectives is to prepare our students for the job market, for the real life, and if this uh, proficiency is expected there, who we are, to, to, if we will try to block it, in a way we cause harm. So we, do, we do not serve our students, we, we, we harm them, and that's the last thing we need to do. I, I'll give you a few examples, okay? Mm -hmm. So if, if you are a student of mine and you use ChatGPT, and it's totally okay for you to use it, I'm not banning it, the other way around, I would praise you for using it, okay? But I want to ask you a few things, okay? I want to get some visibility to the process. What does it mean? It means that I will ask in the paper, through the working on this paper, did you try to use ChatGPT? I want to know what was the experience. Did you manage to get from GPT the answers that you were looking for? Because sometimes... You know, you write a prompt, and it says, I cannot relate to that, or I'm not, I'm only updated until September 2021, and things like So what did you do as a student to work around it? But let's say there were no challenges, and you succeeded to get a good piece of text, okay? So I want you as a student, first of all, to give credit to ChatGPT and write a note to say this paragraph was prepared by the assistance, the support of ChatGPT, great. The other thing that I would ask my students to address is that here's a piece of text of ChatGPT. How did you verify, how did you check that this text is clean for mistakes, for hallucinations, for biases? Because we know it comes with the technology. Right. So I want to ask you, how did you double check and verify the fact and figures and all that, okay? And meaning, did you just did a copy paste or did you went out and cross check and double check this information, how and where? Okay, so you got this piece of text and you know that every time you write a prompt, even if it's the same prompt you get 
a different answer, meaning that the output of ChatGPT is not written in stone, and you can play with it. Right. And so I would ask my students, okay, did you make any changes to this piece of text from the way it was generated originally? Did you take some stuff out? Did you change the order of the things? Did you, did you did some edits? Now, when I'm asking my students to, to elaborate on that, it gives me some visibility into the process. Feeling, yes, they got a piece of text and they started to verify it and they started to edit it. So here I start to understand that there was learning, but it doesn't stop uh, here, okay? Mm -hmm. I would also ask my students to put in an annex to their work the entire conversation, which is a GPT, from start to finish. And I would look on this, this appendix, and I'm less interested about the answers that ChatGPT wrote. I would look on the prompt. I would look on the question. So here I see a question, and then ChatGPT wrote whatever it wrote. And then comes another question. And this allows me to see that the student read the initial output. Something was missing. Or he, want, he wanted to add something. He wanted to elaborate on something. You know. So... To me, as a teacher, I, when I see the process, I know that there was some learning. If I see good questions, good prompts. Right. And I would say one more thing, that ultimately, the ultimate check would be ask the student to come in front of the class and to present and defend his work. Meaning, you did a paper on whatever topic you did. Please come to the front of the class and present it and defend it and answer questions. Now, some people would say, I did this student's work with ChatGPT to stay, prepare the work, then he memorized everything by heart, and now he comes in front of the class to present it. And I would say, okay. So really what you're saying is, let's modify the process in order yes. to take the greatest advantage of a new technology. And, exactly. And coming out of that, somewhat what you're uncovering is that you're seeing if your students have critical thinking skills. You're seeing uh -huh. if there's a real learning process happening. And in order yeah. to ask good questions, you really have to have a fundamental understanding of the subject matter. And I think all of those things you're drawing out in a way that takes advantage of a new technology. And I, I'm so happy we're talking about this because you know, my first exposure was reading all these terrible articles about how bad it's going to be. But the way you express it, why not be open to something that can actually improve the process? I guess, though, with any new technologies, and it happened to be on the news yesterday about the use of um, scammers using AI to such an extent where they're actually copying voices in a way that if you get a phone call, you can't tell whether that's the real person that you know or it's an AI voice and then they're coming up with all these security ideas. AI has become in the crosshairs of many governments because of it has potential for significant harm to society. But I keep thinking, I'm going back to what we talked about before, that AI has been around for quite some time and bad actors probably have had access to it for some time. Do you feel that it's already too late to, number one, ban it or stop it? I don't think that's the right answer. Regulation, yes, but we need to change some of the laws. Our laws are not up to date to really enforce something on a technology that many lawmakers don't understand. Right. We cannot ban it. Even if we try, we would lose it and be useless. So let's not start a path when we know for sure we, we are going to lose. So of course, it's a wake-up call for regulators okay, to get their hands around and into this, this area and, and, and start to, to understand the, the risk and start to legislate things that are saying what is okay and what is not okay. And we don't have 30 years to do that. The reason I'm saying 30 years that, you know, there was a gap of 30 years between the Marlboro cowboy smoking on his horse right. in the 60s until the general surgeon and the FDA and whoever right. started to put some warnings on cigarette boxes that this can cause cancer and kidney. 
So we don't have 30 years. I hope this time we would be as regulator, okay? And more efficient and quick and faster. We need to do it. But again, the reason that we as regulators, for example, are, are challenged with this thing cannot justify to ban it. So just do your job as regulator and do it more efficiently and more quickly. But you cannot ban it. Right. Excellent. Excellent point. Amir, thanks for all your insights. And before we finish, and this is something I ask all of my guests, what one word describes who you are? In one word, I would say curiosity. Ah. And if I need to elaborate on that, as I mentioned in my introduction, I was curious about the internet. I was curious about electronic commerce, about mobile commerce, about business intelligence about artificial intelligence, some things are going to come which I still don't know, but I want to learn them and I want to investigate them. And I want to see what are the opportunities as well as the, the risks and the challenges. I, I'm not ignoring those things. So I think, in our world, curiosity, if I may add another word, is adaptation. We need to adapt. Mm. How that, Darwin said, it's not the strongest. It's the adapting. Uh, and I think in this super fast, dynamic world of, of technologies, curiosity on one thing and then adaptation, but still with, you know, criticism. It's the third element in this mix. Curiosity, adaptation, and, and criticism. You know, some people ask, am I going to be replaced with AI? And I say, no, he's <laughs> not going to be replaced with an, by an AI. You're going to be replaced by other people who learn and adapt and know to use AI better than you. Those people are going to replace you. That's my you know, message. I would say, first off, being curious about anything is typically an aspect of being, number one, a good student, and number two, that curiosity oftentimes spawned the next entrepreneur. So I appreciate that. And then also adding being adaptive and obviously critical and having those critical thinking skills that make us successful. Amir, thank you so much for being part of our series and I really appreciate your time. Sure, thank you, John. Thanks again for, for Deb for making the, the connection. Uh, you know, to all my faculty in NYIT that uh, jumped up my uh, career and to you, John, and uh, to our audience. And it, it was uh, a real pleasure, you know, sharing those thoughts with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Transformational change is often used to describe a complete reimagining and reshaping of an organization in response to or in the expectation of significant changes in its competitive environment, market demands, or technological advancements, as in the case of artificial intelligence. There is little doubt that AI has the potential for leaders to rethink how work is done and data is analyzed. A reimagining of a business's products and services and even its customer interactions. For example, Dr. Geffen talked about the reimagining of the process and systems used by educators, the potential for creating a personalized adaptive learning path based on how a student learns, their pace of learning, and their level of proficiency. There's also the challenge to integrate the use of AI into teaching methods and how we use it as a tool for learning. He related his own experience in seeing ChatGPT listed as an author in peer-reviewed articles. If this is an acceptable method of research, then perhaps we need to rethink how we assess learning and the completion of assignments. The challenge for educators, leaders, and business executives is to define objectives and develop strategies for preparing students for a job market that will demand skills using AI, just like any other tool. But as Dr. Geffen points out, there are real concerns about the potential misuse of AI, how it learns, how it ingests copyrighted materials and annotates. With any new technology comes the fear of misuse, how our personal information is turned against us to commit crimes. We already see this with the internet and social media. And so regulators cannot spend decades waiting to promulgate the rules and boundaries of AI. They're already well behind the curve. His advice to those just beginning or already in the workforce or running a business is to be less worried about being replaced by AI and more concerned with people and competitors who have learned, adapted, and utilize AI better than you. They're the ones that you should be concerned with. And in response to my question, what one word describes who you are? 
Amir said, curiosity. Curiosity was especially important given his interest in rapidly advancing technologies. But he added a modifier. He called for a mix of curiosity, adaptation, and criticism or critical thinking about what your curiosity uncovers. We thank Dr. Geffen for sharing his knowledge and valuable insights. This podcast is executive produced by John Robecki and New York Institute of Technology in conjunction with the School of Management and the Office of Strategic Communications and External Affairs. The Interim Dean of the School of Management and Executive Producer of this podcast is Deborah Cohen. Our Marketing and Social Media Strategist is Petra Shantaraga, and our Audio Editor and Mixer is Brian Falk from Abacus Entertainment. Special thanks to Professor Ellie Schwartz and Victoria Greco for all their support. Until next time.